And welcome to this expert chat today on mental health among children, youth, and young adults. I want to begin by thanking um, everyone who has helped bring this together, primarily the Batten School for, Public, for Leadership and Public Policy. Um, it's, it's an honor to be offering this talk today, and um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to do so. Um, my name is Brooke Lehman. I am a, by background, I am a clinical social worker and an attorney, and my path has been anything but straight in getting to where I am now, which is primarily as a federal lobbyist for children, adolescents, and young adults, mental health, health, child welfare, and education, and I also have the privilege of being a lecturer at the Batten School. Primarily there, I teach social policy of various kinds, um, including an entire semester course on mental health. And I also run a clinic that offers students a real-time opportunity to work on my clients' issues and get a feel for what federal advocacy looks like. Um, I want to make one note about technology today, and that is that I'm going to be taking questions at the end through the Q&A and not chat. And I want to point that out because I don't want to miss any of your great questions, comments, feedback, which I um, encourage you all to share. Um, and I want to say one other thing. I want to give you the caveat that I have given to the folks at Batten who have helped put this together. And that is that this is a topic I am very, very passionate about and can sometimes go on for too long talking about it. In fact, sometimes it's hard for me to condense all that I want to say into an entire semester. But I'm going to do my absolute best um, to be concise and leave opportunities for us to have a discussion because that's really what I would like to be able to do today is hear from you all, learn from you, and hopefully share some insight into what we're seeing these days with regard to the mental health of our young people. Um, I'm hoping to be able to provide you with a better understanding of where we stand today as well as where we've come from. Um, as well as what I'm doing at the federal level. Um, as you know, there have been many packages related to COVID. There's been a lot of activity with Black Lives Matter, all kinds of um, social and political and health-related concerns, um, really more than concerns, frankly, that are driving up not just the, I mean, mental health and emotional well-being of everyone, um, but included in that and often overlooked are children and youth. And I should say that I'm going to probably be saying different terms, children, youth, young adults. Um, please know that within that I am speaking about the same range of folks the entire time. I just may shift from term to term. So before I begin talking about the current status, I thought I'd begin by contextualizing today's discussion with a brief look at what has led to the mental health services that are and are not available to children in this time. Um, there are many obstacles uh, that we face in the development and understanding of child and adolescent mental illness, um, behavioral health, emotional well-being. Um, and I think they are the same for adults, but it has posed greater challenges to those of us who have been, been seeking information, interventions, um, therapies of all kinds for youth. The three things that I really want to discuss are stigma and bias, which are still an issue today, obviously, but we've made some progress on that science or the lack thereof, um, and then the subjectivity of diagnosing and treating mental disorders of all kinds, because it is different than other forms of medical practice. Um, so let me start with a personal example. When I was a practitioner a long, long time ago, um, back in that day, and I'll let you define what back in that day means, I'm not going to actually tell you. We didn't diagnose adolescents, for example, with bipolar. This was a disorder that primarily affected adults. And when we wanted to kind of 
push those boundaries, we might have extended it to young adults, including um, those in the 18 to 21 range. But again, that was really pushing it. Um, why? My opinion is that it was a confluence of issues at play, which have fortunately changed over time. For one, I think there was a general belief that children and youth didn't experience mental illness of any kind at some point, which seems preposterous in these days, but in fact was very much the thought only just a few decades ago. If you were a child, say, with heightened anxiety or evidencing behaviors that might be now considered potentially depression, these were things that were discussed behind closed doors. Um, they were hushed conversations, um, certainly not something that you shared with the public, sometimes even family and friends, which we now know is, is very different today. Um, it was often thought that these types of fears, um, lack of motivation, other things that might evidence mental health disorders were seen as weaknesses that hopefully a child would outgrow or an adolescent would outgrow. Or actually speaking of adolescents, oppositional defiance was something that we did diagnose a lot of adolescents with, but I have to say having one of them my own, aren't they all oppositional defiant? That seems to be the basic demeanor, I think, of that age group. Um, but in any event, that was the thought, that was the behavior, that was um, society's view on children and adolescents and young adults in terms of whether or not they actually were experiencing mental illness, emotional distress, etc. Fortunately, along came science and that has really helped to change how we now look at uh, various disorders that children and adolescents suffer from. As with many medical practices and interventions, including psychotropic drugs, um, these are often developed for adults. Um, we know that many interventions, whether it's surgeries, medications, therapies, are based on a typical adult, and I say typical adult, and unfortunately, those same practices and interventions are often, for children, much farther down the road. Typically, honestly, after a lot of the money has been distributed, reimbursement decided, etc. To be fair, I don't want to blame it all on financing or the fact that we don't consider children and adolescents as anything other than little adults. Um, when we're talking about psychotropic medications in particular, these are a class of drugs that have significant side effects of all kinds, many of which with regard to children are still unknown. So it's also a very um, conflicting situation for parents to determine and to feel comfortable with offering this as an intervention to their children. I have three children. I have two who are currently medicated for um, mood dysregulation, ADHD, and heightened anxiety or an anxiety disorder. And it's certainly not a decision that we made lightly, even given my background and my husband who's a physician. So I don't want to blame um, everything on money and just say that there are other things that we need to consider when we're talking about children and youth. Finally, I also think that mental health in and of itself remains somewhat of a subject, subjective, excuse me, um, field of medical practice. So unlike other medical interventions, other forms of physical medicine practices, we can't use x-rays, MRIs, CT scans, minimally invasive procedures 
to really look at what is happening from an emotional standpoint in mental health. Now, I'm making sweeping generalizations, and I should put that out as a caveat that this entire discussion is based on sweeping generalizations because we really don't have the time to go into all of the details. So I hope I am not um, antagonizing those who uh, feel differently about some of the things that I'm proposing because I'm not able to offer in the time I have with you all today to go into greater detail. Because there are ways um, that certainly science has brought about significant changes. However, it still is somewhat subjective. We do have the capability now to look at a child's brain who has been subjected to ongoing adverse experiences such as trauma and see the developmental delay in that brain versus a child who has not been exposed to those experiences. And we see the difference and it's significant. But ultimately, this is still a form of practice that relies on practitioners to take into consideration all of the factors around them, environmental, what they are seeing, what may be not being said, et cetera, and make a diagnosis and um, begin in a course of therapy of, of various kinds based on all of that. So again, when it comes to children, I think we have found it very difficult to look at a child's behavior Look at temper tantrums, for example. Um, all kids have them. Some kids have them at a greater level or for prolonged periods of time. Is that something that should be part of an equation when we're trying to look at the mental well-being and the mental health of a child? Probably, but maybe not. Um, many children go to the nurse every day at the same time with stomach aches and headaches. Um, we see the same in young adults. This is perhaps performance anxiety. This is a class that they don't like. This is a class where they don't excel. Is that mental illness? Is that emotional distress beyond the norm? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. And that's the squishiness, really, of mental illness. I will say that there are many people who believe that the pendulum has swung too far that in fact, there are too many children and young adults currently diagnosed with some form of mental illness, disorder, emotional distress, and many of whom are receiving medication as part of their therapy. The feeling on that is that life stresses happen. We experience loss, we experience grief, we experience anxiety over all kinds of things. Um, some days we feel better than others. Some days we're more motivated than others. So the question is, when does that deviate from the norm? And has the pendulum swung so far that we are now allowing that norm to have moved so that more people, more young adults, more children, are not falling within the normal category. Again, it's very, very subjective and some of the difficulty we have in working with children and adolescents and young adults around mental health. So to summarize, because I did say I would try and move th through this relatively quickly, I think it's fair to say that mental illness and behavioral health among children, youth, and young adults has been evolving. It has taken longer than it has for adults, but the good news is we've come a long way. These populations are experiencing now, we are now able to recognize what these populations are experiencing and the opportunities that, that we have for interventions has grown significantly. I've witnessed it over the course of my career. I see in students these days at UVA, a very open and uh, a willingness to discuss a variety of emotional stresses, um, their, might, their, their mental health concerns, and again, coming from a place where we used to talk about this behind closed doors, a vast difference. So I think that's the bright side to all of this. Um, okay, so now what? What about these youth today?
Um, first, we need to know a little bit of the baseline. I'd like to provide you with a little bit of the baseline that we had prior to COVID, because that's really kind of what we're talking about. What COVID has done to exacerbate the mental well-being of everybody, but for today's purposes for children, adolescents, and young adults. So even going back just a few months ago, before we really started experiencing this pandemic, there was already an exponential growth, as I've alluded to, in the number of children, youth and young adults, who were in need of some form of intervention related to emotional distress or whatever. And we see this manifested in the ever-increasing rates of youth suicide, for example. Um, we see this in the number of children who are being diagnosed with therapies. Um, and we also see this in, um, gosh, there's so many other ways that this was evident even prior to COVID. Um, I can give an example related to youth, um, young adults actually, who needed to take a semester off of school or perhaps take a gap year because they needed the time and space to pull back in order to move forward in a more productive manner. So what has COVID done to this? Well, like I said, for everybody, it has exacerbated it from a crisis to a pandemic of its own. Um, the isolation, the loss, the grief, the lack of structure, little if any social interaction, things such as group activities like sports and other thing, you know, arts, opportunities for people to come together um, and not knowing how their education is going to move forward is driving the rates of anxiety and depression among this population to rates we've never seen before. If we're talking about young adults, those in college or within that time frame, they have the added stressors of loss of employment that supported their academic careers. Um, recent graduates whose jobs have now been put on hold, interrupted internships, um, all kinds of opportunities that further compound how their mental well-being um, and emotional well-being um, are experienced. While children and youth are more resilient than we often give them credit for, it is, it is extremely important that we begin to recognize that what we often in this unique period of time attribute as stressors to adults, we understand that they are equally impacting children, youth, and young adults. So among those of us, let's talk about what I'm doing on Capitol Hill a little bit to try and mitigate the circumstances that we have before us. Um, it, it's been very, very interesting to watch as these various COVID relief packages have passed. I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't already know when I say these packages, and appropriately so, have mainly focused on uh, providing resources to health systems, to frontline workers, to funding PPE, to funding immunization trials, um, to providing uh, unemployment payments and general economic recovery. That's obviously appropriate and necessary from my opinion, um, but we've seen very little, in fact, we've seen nothing related to children and adolescents, even within the categories of health services and access to those services. Now, we should point out, or I should be pointing out that you know, we do know that COVID has not impacted children and young adults to any degree that it has been impacting adults. And so perhaps that's why we're not seeing them recognized in these relief bills. However, what we do know now as well is that as young adults are leaving 
homes or places that they retreated to as their campuses are reopening, as limitations are being lifted and movement is being, greater movement is being allowed. We are seeing an alarming rise of cases in the young adult population. So those who are otherwise healthy um, and not compromised in a variety of health ways are now contracting the virus and developing the disease. So we hope and we have been told that this next relief package is going to focus on children and the economy. Has it? That's the question. So I work specifically on an issue um, that creates access points to care for children and youth primarily in, well, really only in um, vulnerable communities, whether they be urban, suburban, or rural. It's, they're referred to as school-based health centers. I like to say that they're doctor's offices in schools although they can be much more in terms of the broad range of service delivery as well as their integration into the schools. Um, in fact, while I'm speaking, there's a hearing going on right now with a bill that I've been promoting to support school-based health centers. Um, the hope is to get that into this final package. Uh, will, we, will we get it in there? I don't know. Um, the House has released their first iteration of what they consider to be this final relief package, which is the HEROES Act. And while there's a lot of money in there for a lot of money being relative in congressional speak for schools, um, as we begin to look at reopening or not reopening or creating some kind of hybrid environment in schools through higher education, um, there's considerable funding there, um, but as is typical in Congress, it's very broad and it goes to states and to local education agencies to determine within a broad set of parameters how to use those funds. In fact, when I did a search of that bill, the only, if I looked at child, um, it came under the nutrition uh, supplemental program, which is very important. Child health didn't come up at all. Student health couldn't be found in the entire text of the bill. So it makes me wonder when we speak about this relief package actually addressing a variety of needs for children and youth, where that is exactly going to come from. We have yet to see the Senate bill. Portions of it have been rele uh, released already. There is a committee in the Senate that has not released their bill, which would contain uh, information, language, et cetera, for schools, which could be, and, and health as well. So we'll wait and see uh, what that yields. But I'm working with superintendents, parents, students, medical practitioners, local and state leaders to secure funding for this particular model. The details of how that would happen are far beyond our conversation today, although I could obviously talk about it forever. Um, but we'll wait and see. We've, we've had a lot of, like I said, promises. There's been a lot of talk about inclusion of children's needs. But it all comes back to whether or not we choose to recognize and therefore address the mental health, in this case for purposes of the discussion today, those needs within the child and adolescent young adult population. As I said very early on in this conversation, um, it's been a struggle all along to have this population included in that broader uh, dialogue and in the broader opportunities for prevention, early intervention, and then the therapies that might become available for those who are in fact diagnosed. So it's, it, it may be a bit of, stre of a stretch for us to get needed healthcare services into this next relief package for children and adolescents. Is, is that fatal? No. There are going to be, by fatal, I mean, excuse me, fatal to securing funding, no. There will be other opportunities, but it seems very intuitive that as we think about schools reopening and we think about students going back to their higher education, um, their places of higher education, that we need to recognize the health and well-being 
of that population as well as adults. So with that, I'm going to stop now because I think I've gone on longer than I had anticipated and see if there are any questions out there, comments. I'd love to hear from you because I imagine some of you out there um, know aspects of this um, and are experts in this area as well. I'm also happy to answer any questions that you might have since I just threw a lot at you in a, in a very short and rapid way. So, questions. I see we have some. All right. So, how do you go about reducing the stigma surrounding mental health with our children? Fascinating question, and it's something that I discuss with my students all the time as we're talking about mental illness among this population. Um, I think the answer that I have found to this question is awareness building. It really is still very basic education and awareness building. So opportunities for discussions like today but also within community settings of all kinds to raise the fact that children and youth are experiencing mental illness and emotional distress. Again, I think one of the major obstacles that we face is still the desire to not, to not recognize, I don't want to say recognize, but to hope that children and adolescents aren't experiencing these difficulties. And so I think a lot of people choose not to believe it's the case when in fact it absolutely is. So I think the more that we can talk about it, the more that we can educate people, the more science that we can put behind those conversations, I think lends credibility to those discussions. And the science is out there. It has been slower to materialize, but it is in fact out there. Um, I think that's how we reduce the stigma. I don't think the stigma will ever go away um because there are also you have to take into consideration cultural aspects and there are many every culture sees mental illness and mental health differently our youngest daughter is adopted from haiti and um mental illness there or, and its manifestations um are linked to voodoo in many cases and um those individuals are shunned. So I, that doesn't mean that all Haitians see it that way, but it does tell us, it is an example of how stigma will remain, but can we move past the point where our awareness and our desire to address it within this population exceeds the negative stigma that we experience? And I think we're getting there. As I said, this population, this generation, excuse me, of young adults and, and even children, for them it's becoming much more of a commonplace among each other to discuss these things. So that is, that is my hope, and I hope um, that that's a sufficient answer. Um, let's see, the next question is, what role do you think school nurses play in the advocacy surrounding mental health? I, I think a very significant role. Um, I work closely with school nurses and the nursing associations around the country. And I think that in the schools, depending on the position that school nurses are afforded in various schools, because the regulations regarding what they can and cannot do vary significantly across the country, I think they are one of the most important um, sites of triage. So I think absolutely when a child is coming down at the same time every day with a stomach ache or a headache or a need to lie down um, it is our school nurses who recognize that pattern or can recognize that pattern and again depending on their skill level and the laws and regulations that determine their practice they can be extremely instrumental in helping to address what they believe are emotional stressors they can, it, because they're integrated in the schools, they can work with the teachers, um, and often they can refer out if they don't have more resources in the school. So I think it's a very significant role that school nurses play, and my hope over time is that where their role is still limited, that that is increased in order to enable them to be 
a larger part of the broader movement of early identification and um, early intervention. Our, okay, so are certain groups of youth disproportionately affected by mental health issues? Are certain groups being underdiagnosed and not given the resource? Absolutely. Um, we know that communities of color, immigrant populations, Native American populations have some of the highest rates of children experiencing mental health disorders broadly. Um, both from a organic standpoint, so from a genetic standpoint, but also from an environmental standpoint. It's the whole nature nurture. A lot of these children and youth in these communities are experiencing ongoing trauma, food insecurity, housing instability, a number of factors that lead to all around anxiety. And what we know about anxiety in children is that it can manifest in so many different ways. So it isn't just your basic panic attack, it can be anger, it can be disruptive behavior, it can be a whole host of things. So on top of the fact that these children are living in the environments that they are living in and are experiencing what they are and have the emotional distresses that they do, um, they also can exhibit these behaviors in ways that make, for example, uh, school challenging for them. Maybe being in the classroom is more difficult. Maybe um, their behavior is disruptive in the classroom and the teacher pulls them out. Um, and on top of that, they have less access to care. I mean, that's just a known fact. I worked in Washington, D.C. for a long time as a practitioner. And if you know anything about Washington, D.C., there were kind of bright lines between the more affluent um, portions of the, the city and the, and, and the poorest. And in Ward 8, it's divided by wards, you had the highest concentration of children in that particular ward. Um, and there was no pediatric health or mental health services available in that entire ward. So school-based health centers, which as you just heard I'm working on and trying to promote, are the sources of care in those communities. Um, as for whether or not they're being diagnosed at a higher or rate or frankly, underdiagnosed. I think it's more a case of, well, I think it's everything, including misdiagnosed. So I think, um, one, we may overdiagnose them, and in that I've seen in, and, and some people would, I think, not agree with me, but certainly when I worked in schools, I saw that with ADHD and the line that formed at noon for children to access their afternoon medications because it seemed like everybody had ADHD and having them treated made everything a little bit easier on a school environment. And I don't fault the school for that. Um, I think in terms of being misdiagnosed, again, we often look at the behavior of children who come from communities of color, our immigrants, our Native Americans, are part of ones I'm not even mentioning, and view their behavior very differently and don't jump to the conclusion, well, not even jump to the conclusion, but explore the idea that that could be mental illness versus more typical behavior associated with those communities. And I think that they're underdiagnosed for the same reason and by virtue of having less access to care. Should COVID cause schools to remain closed for an extended period of time? How could the inclusion of mental health supports in legislation serve American youth? Um, great questions. I will not step out there as an expert into, as to whether or not schools should remain open or should close for an extended period of time because I have my own personal opinion. I'm not speaking as an expert um, in terms of public health. Um, I can mention that my husband has a lot to say on this as a physician. Um, 
Personally, I think it's intuitive that we need to protect our kids just like we need to protect each other from being in large groups. I, I, I think that's, to me, just something that we need to accept as part of the pandemic that we find ourselves in. Um, we also look at schools and know that there are parents who have to work. And, you know, so that's a challenge right there. So I, 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 I don't want to speak on record as, as recommending one or the other. It is, I will say, something that troubles me as a parent, knowing what the best thing to do is for my children, not just from an educational standpoint, but from a social and emotional standpoint as well as we know that the isolation that they're experiencing is contributing to their um, lack of emotional well-being. Um, so how could mental health um, in legislation support American youth? Oh, in so many ways. Um, funding for greater access to resources. So if we fund places like school-based health centers, community behavioral health centers, if these were resourced appropriately, they could not only continue to do the work that they're doing, they could expand. So what we know from school-based health centers is the number one service requested by students making use of school-based health centers is for behavioral health. And school-based health centers do all they can to provide that. Can they always? No, not necessarily because the funding isn't there. Um, it's not just a case of direct funding, however, it's also looking at reimbursement. So we face uh, with mental health largely um, um, a reduced reimbursement rate, uh, a more narrow focused reimbursement. Um, it, 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 that varies from private to public, but there are a lot of obstacles that could be addressed through federal legislation that wouldn't cure the problems, um, but could certainly provide for greater early identification, which is huge, um, and early intervention. So a lot of these children that end up being diagnosed with a disorder and go through therapy and medication, um, some of those could be or could have their stressors addressed much earlier and it would not end up requiring um, the deeper end services that are necessary when not earlier identified and um, mitigated. So again, I think that there have been many bills that have been proposed related to children and adolescents and youth, including on college campuses, in order to expand resources. Some of that is education and awareness building among students that behavioral health, mental illness, um, all of these things occur and that they're natural and normal, and that goes back to the stigma um, question from earlier. Um, they've Some have passed, some haven't. Um, so I, I just, I think that Congress and the administrations need to look at the tools that they possess, given their balance of powers, and utilize them to a fuller extent to help make more resources available for the continuum of uh, emotional and mental well-being. Due to the increase in unemployment and many individuals' reliance on insurance access through employers, do we have any idea of how mental health care access has been impacted over the past four months? Also curious if you know how this breaks down for youth. That's an excellent question. Um, I think a lot of this data is yet to be discoverable. Um, I think we have the anecdotal data to say that certainly we are seeing higher levels of stress as I said, higher levels of anxiety and depression in youth, um, children and young adults. Um, again, I talked about how children are resilient, um, but they also hear and feel more than we give them credit for sometimes. So they're feeling the stress, they're hearing the conversations of parents and guardians and family members who have 
been le- uh, who have lost their jobs um, and lost insurance? Is there greater utilization of ERs? Can we say that yet? I don't think that we actually have the data to back that up, but I think intuitively and certainly anecdotally, we can see that the loss of unemployment and therefore lack of access to insurance and insurance being somewhat of a gatekeeper to health and mental health services, there is a negative outcome associated with that. Now I could go on about how if you're receiving unemployment, you should be able to access Medicaid and other public health services. Um, But that gets very complicated and is probably beyond what anybody would like me to talk about at this time. So anecdotally, intuitively, yes, unemployment and loss of insurance is absolutely impacting populations of all kinds. And I work a lot with children with special health care needs, and we're seeing it there. Um, It will be interesting to see when we have more data collected. But as you all know, this is a moving target. It every day appears to be different. Um, because of COVID. It is impacting all areas of our lives and we go to bed with it with one set of numbers before us and one situation in front of us and circumstances and then we wake up to more uh, more news, things have changed, things are different. So um, I think it's an ongoing conversation and um, I hope that the data is being collected even in this rapid environment that we find ourselves in now. Oh, and that was Laura. That was one of my former students. Um, can you speak to how funding can be used to improve the culture, physical structure of schools? How might public funding enhance school climate and infrastructure to support good mental health? I can, in fact, speak to this, and I'd be happy to do so. Um, I work with an organization here in town, and this is just an example which I provide called the Reclaimed Hope Initiative. And one of the central missions behind that organization is to create a school climate that is um, more accepting, more welcoming, and more supportive of children who have mental illness. What does that look like? There are a variety of interventions, um, programs and practices that have been developed across the country that have been utilized by different school systems to try and create a climate that recognizes and and, um, addresses in a more supportive manner the mental health needs of students versus in a more punitive manner. Um, We have a long way to go And federal funding, could it help? Yeah, absolutely, it could, because it could employ more of the appropriate professionals that we need in schools to be able to function in a capacity that would add that to the school climate. Um, I can tell you that as it relates to Reclaimed Hope Initiative, what Bettina Stevens, who is the founder of that organization, found is that her children who are adopted suffer um, many different significant health conditions, including um, PTSD, so post-traumatic stress disorder, among other mental health disorders as well, autism. And they have certain triggers that lead them to experience trauma over and over and over again. One of them is fur. Why? Nobody knows. But one of her children, um, if they see fur, it's a trigger. And they go into rage and other ways of experiencing their PTSD. Teachers, when they didn't want the student, this particular child, to utilize computers, they put a piece of fur on the computer to keep him, in this case, away from the computer. Now, that's not maliciously intent, right? But it is an uninformed approach that led to significant consequences for that child and that family. So it's really how do we educate teachers, school professionals of all kinds and at all levels um, how to recognize mental illness in children, emotional distress in children, 
and have the appropriate personnel and strategies for addressing and mitigating uh, the outcome of those in schools. I think federal legislation, and I have seen some of this um, proposed at least, would allow for um, those particular professionals to be hired within a school. They could also, funding could also support experts who can help schools develop the practices um, that, they, that they need. Bettina could easily go around and help schools adopt different policies and practices. So I do think that federal funding um, is needed in this area. And I know I've been sounding, I, I've probably sounded like federal funding is needed in every area. And sometimes that's true. And sometimes it's a case of us changing our priorities and utilizing the dollars that we have differently. Again, this goes to prioritizing the well-being of children and youth, particularly as it relates to mental health. So additional funding could be used to address a lot of what we're seeing. Also, current funding could be used differently in order to address what we're seeing. So I hope that that answers your question. And looks like we're coming up on one o'clock. I'm still here. I'd love to answer any additional questions. I'd also like to share any comments that any of you might have in the audience. Um, so I'll pause for a few minutes and see if we have any more of those. And if not, we can wrap things up. Um, I will say while we're waiting to see if there's anybody else who would like to speak. Um, my contact information is available to all of you and I encourage you to contact me at any time, whether it's to discuss um, a specific aspect of this. I can lead you to resources to go into greater depth on any of the issues that we've discussed today um, or maybe offer some assistance as you're making your way through your own personal process as well. I am engaged in a very small practice to keep my um, hands in the work with these families. So, um, you know, I like to offer as much help as I can. So I'm going to say that since there haven't been any additional questions that will wrap up for today. But again, I want to thank you all for taking time out of your day to sit and listen to me. Um, it's a very important question, not I mean, a very important topic, not just to me, and I told you all about my passion earlier today, um, but it's an important conversation for all of us to be having, and it's something that the more we all engage in, the better off we all will be. Um, raising the awareness, reducing the stigma, funding additional science in this area, creating greater access, allowing for earlier intervention, prevention in all communities is what we need to see the numbers start to lower with children and adolescents who are experiencing mental illness um, and emotional distress of any kind. So thank you and um, I look forward to hearing from you in the future. <laughs>